Hi all, today I'm going to be going through the um, February 15th recitation group work. This is actually a review of um, chapter 11, 12, and 13, which is what our exam is going to be over. So um, for this group work video, I first want to start by saying it is really important for you to oxidize, or oxidize <laughs> for you to organize your notes. So Dr. Corrales was nice and gave like kind of a broken down overview of the important topics in each chapter. So that is really nice, but hopefully you can organize your notes in a way that makes sense to you and make sure all of these are included. But you should have at least a basic understanding of each of these chapter overviews to feel prepared for the exam. I really wanna encourage you to feel like you know the definitions of each of these things and how the reactions occur. Um, <clears throat> so please, please, please check these out and make sure you have a basic understanding of all of these. This is a really great review for the exam. And then I went through and compiled every video that I've made for chapter 11, 12, and 13. And I'm going to link um, to those in an announcement in class. So hopefully that will be helpful to you. Um, and I, maybe I'll try to link it in the description below. I don't actually know if I can even do that. So that's the beginning of this. Um, and then the first question is, um, using the topics above, create one exam question as a group and turn it in on the note card provided. So one thing I want to say is making your own practice exam is a really, really good policy or a really good uh, technique to study and practice because it forces you to think about the kinds of questions that might be on the exam and to make sure you have a thorough understanding of each of those. And then you can also time yourself and make sure you're getting questions done in the right amount of time and um, that you feel like you fully, you know, you can kind of build your, build your confidence so you're fully ready. Sometimes when we're practicing, we'll be like practicing questions and then checking the answer, practicing questions and then checking the answer. But you don't get to do that on the exam. So it's kind of scary because you can't build your confidence up by checking your answer. So if you can make a practice exam and do it in the right amount of time, then you can kind of see where your weaknesses are and you can build confidence like, oh, I got 75% of these right. That's pretty good. I need to study these areas before the exam. And I did all of that without ever checking the answers while I was going. So I really want to encourage you to do that. Um, okay, and now the next question is, indicate which product should be obtained from the chlorination of 1,5-hexadiene at a high temperature. So um, first, let's draw 1,5-hexadiene. That's hexane, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that's one, five hexadiene um, at high temperature. So whenever I see high temperature I, and a, a chlorine, then I know that's going to be a radical reaction. And usually we see those happening with um, regular old, like plain alkanes or alkynes. Uh, but it will also happen on um, double bonds wherever the most stable radical would form. So normally we have the initiation step where the chlorine breaks up and then the propagation step where the chlorine will, or whatever your radical is, will, that should be a single barbed arrow, will take a hydrogen that leaves behind the most stable radical and then that will combine with the other radical to make a chlorine on what used to be a plain old alkane. So that's chlorination, but it can also happen here. And oh, I will say that you can do this with chlorine or bromine. Bromine's a lot more selective, so it will usually choose the more stable one. But with chlorination, it will kind of go anywhere it can go. And um, so you would get this product, but you would also get a less stable product right here. Both of those are possibilities, so you have to look out for that. And it could go here or here or here, but those there's symmetry right down the middle. So this carbon and this carbon are the only two different options. Like if it attacked on this side, you'd basically just get this molecule again because of the symmetry. So we have a similar situation here where first I always look for the most stable. So um, we have our chlorine radical and that's the initiation step. And then propagation, it's gonna take the most stable position. And the most stable position is of course the allylic radical position. So one away from a double bond. When it's right on a double bond, that's a lot less stable. That's the vinylic position, and it's not great. Um, so you have that plus HCl, and then Cl minus plus this is <clears throat> chlorine. 
Okay, so that would be um, one major product. This is definitely the most stable product. So another possibility is it's probably not going to form a radical. If it formed a radical right here, that's identical because of the symmetry. It probably won't form a radical right on this double bond because it's vanillic and it's really unstable, not like allylic. But there could be a resonance structure right here where um, instead of I'll start fresh, when you have the radical formed, it's possible that a resonance structure could occur leaving behind this. Um, so if that happened, this would be stabilized by resonance and then the, the termination step would be the same. Oh, that was a terrible arrow, but you get the picture and your chlorine could add right here. So I would say these are the two possible products, but this would definitely be the most stable product. Okay, <clears throat> using the following compounds in order of decreasing levels of oxidation. So one way you can do this, and I think Dr. Corrales does this um, in their key that they'll post, but you can count up all the oxidation numbers for each carbon. I don't do that. What I look at is bonds to hydrogen and oxygen. So, um, but you don't have to do it like me. This is how I do it. And I think it's like a simpler and faster way, but you're 100% guaranteed to get it right if you count up the other thing. So I look at hydrogen bond or look at bonds to hydrogen. Technically hydrogen bonds are a different thing. So this one draws my eye first as it has um, a double bond to an oxygen, but there's two hydrogen at each of these points. So that's not great. Um, here, there's only one, two, three, four, five, six bonds to hydrogen. And here there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So, when looking at these, I'm saying um, this one has only six, so I think that's number two, or that's going to be the most oxidized. And then between these, these are both 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. These are both have 10 bonds to hydrogen, but this one has oxy oxygen and this one doesn't. So oxygen increases your oxidation state where carbon-carbon bonds are like neutral. So um, I'm going to say that one is next and then three is the least oxidized or the lowest oxidation level. So that usually works for me, but just in case, if you want to learn the rules to add up the numbers, I'm not good at remembering like numbers like that. Like I think it's negative one to hydrogen, which doesn't make sense to me because I feel like hydrogen should be positive. So I always get confused when calculating the numbers. So I learned how to reason my way through it, but I am not guaranteeing you that that's foolproof as much as just doing the, um, knowing the numbers, but that has consistently worked for me, but I don't want to get you in trouble. Okay, the next question is which carbon would be the least stable and why? So um, the best, you know, is if you have resonance, like allylic is great, benzylic is great, and then uh, tertiary, secondary, and primary. And primary is not great. And vanillic is also not great. Vanillic. Vinyl means it's like in the vicinity, um, like vicinal. So right on there is allylic is one away, and right on there is vinyl. So I'm saying this vanillic one is the worst. Um, but I'm actually going to go as far as to rank all of them. So this is primary, and there's no resonance. This is secondary, and there's no resonance. This is tertiary, and it's allylic. This is secondary, and it's allylic. And then this is vinylic. So yeah, we already decided that the vinyl, I can never spell this, vinylic. So we already decided that the vinyl one is not very good. Um, tertiary with resonance will be the best. Then secondary, oh, secondary with resonance. So that's four. Then um, regular old secondary is better than primary, is better than vinylic. So um, yeah, that's how I would rank these. Um, I think of like 
resonance is the best. And then like when I'm comparing two with resonance, I still go by tertiary, secondary, primary, because that still lends more stabilization. And resonance stabilization is, or um, carbocation stabilization is all about adding electron density. So resonance adds the electron density, but so do having extra carbons. And that's why um, that's good. Okay. Next question, draw a diene and a dienophile pair that could be used to synthesize the following compounds in diels alder reaction. So in um, my other video about diels alder I talked a little bit about this, but what I do is I find the double bond, and I'm assuming that that double bond is going to be what used to be the diene, because um, when you have a diels alder between carbon 2 and 3 on the diene is where the new double bond is formed in the ring. And so that's what I look for. So I'm assuming this right here is the diene and right here is where the new bonds were formed between carbons um, four and five and six and one. So when I do that, then I draw my diene and my diene file. So one, two, three, four, and then five and six. And then I look at the substituent. So there seems to be a bridge between one and four. So it looks like this must be a ring. And it looks like there are two COOCH3, two esters, which make this a good withdrawing group, good electron withdrawing groups that make this more electron poor. And these carbon, um, what are those called? These uh, substituents that are just like regular old alkanes, those also donate electron density to this, making this more electron rich, so it would react faster than your plain old Dills alder. So this is the pair that I came up with. And then for this one, the same thing, here's the double bond. So I'm assuming that it used to be the diene. So if that used to be the diene, um, the double bond will form between those. So if we start with one, two, three, four, five, and six, then one, two, three, four, five, and six, the double bonds between two and three on the diene. So this must be one, two, three, four, and then this must be carbons five and six. So that's always how I figure it out. That must be the bonds broke here and here between carbons one and six and four and five. So then I just draw the substituents that go with it. So there's a methyl group on carbon one and carbon four. And there's a big old ring on carbon five and six. So I'm actually going to redraw five and six. And stereochemistry is retained. This is five and six. So this is my diene. This is my diene. This is my dienophile. Stereochemistry is retained. So because both of these are trans, they'll both need to be wedges. And because this is a ring, it's fixed in the same position. So it's definitely they're pointing in the same direction. So they both need to be wedges or dashes. Okay, and then same thing here. I can identify my double bond is going to be carbon 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then this must be 5 and 6. So that's carbon 1, 2, 3, and 4. And we have our two methyl groups. And then this must be carbon 5 and 6. And there's two esters off of it. So this is very similar to this first one, but this one... In the first one, instead of two methyls, you had a five-membered ring on your diene. And again, because these are pointed the same direction, they have to be pointing the same direction on here. If it looked like this, your final structure would be one dash and one wedge. So if you have a um, trans bond, one has to be a wedge and one has to be a dash. And if you have a cis bond, they both have to be dashes. So I talk about that at the very end of my Deals Alder video that I posted earlier today on uh, YouTube. Okay, now this one's tricky because there's two double bonds, right? So this could be the diene or this could be the diene. Well, one clue is this is an electron withdrawing group and electron with drawing groups are better on the um, dienophile than the diene. But also if I tried to make this, my diene, there's two double bonds right next to each other, accumulated double bonds, and that's not stable, and it actually kind of makes like a, 
it goes in a straight line and makes an annuline and it kind of looks like this and it's not going to be in the right shape you need it to be in to react for a deals alder so that could be because it's a double bond the diene but it's not going to be the best diene possible or nor do I think it's actually possible for it to get into the right shape for a di uh, deals alder reaction to occur so I don't think that one's likely to be your diene so I'm going to go ahead and go with this one being my diene instead but you always want to check and make sure. And this would be carbons five and six. So one, two, three, one, two, three, four. There's no substituents on that, but there are substituents on my diene a file. It looks like this. So um, that ring is still intact, even though this double bond turns into a single bond. <clears throat> so this is on five and six. Now, one thing I do just to make sure um, is actually if I don't want to take up a ton of time on this video, um, but is I will take these and then try to do the deals reaction forward from starting right here and make sure it gives me what I think it's going to give me based on the um, original starting material. So that's a way you can check yourself and just make sure everything looks right. Okay, <clears throat> now this next question is to propose a synthesis for the following alcohol um, <clears throat> using a green yard reagent. One question I got a lot was C6H5 is actually a benzene ring. Um, it's useful to know that just in case it comes up, but usually C6H5 looks like that. So um, that's just shorthand for benzene ring. So whenever I think of how to do retrosynthesis with a diels alder reaction is whatever became an alcohol usually started out as a carbon meal of some kind. And diels alder reactions makes carbon-carbon bonds. So I can break any one of these carbon-carbon bonds in, did I say diels alder? Green yard reagents make carbon-carbon bonds. So I can break any one of these carbon-carbon bonds and that be my green yard reagent and that will be the answer to my question. So I'll start on this side. If I broke that carbon-carbon bond, let's see, one, two, one, two. And then I would have my benzene ring over on this side. Um, then my green yard reagent would have to be whatever I broke off. So it'd be CH3, MGBR. And then if I go one back from there, it would be MG to get my, uh, CH3BR. So if I start with CH3BR, I add MG, it becomes a green yard reagent add it to this and it would attack right there, kick this up and um, oh yeah, it would turn into an alcohol, but I'd also need um, an additional step of H plus. So I guess technically it's O minus. So that's also, that's a perfect example of why I always work my retrosynthesis forward is because sometimes I'll forget, like I forgot to add that H plus, I would have missed that on an exam if I didn't have that, or at least gotten partial points off. So um, yeah, you have your CH3BR and then you um, add magnesium to get the green yard reagent that will attack, kick this up, it'd be O minus with the CH3 group right there. And then you'd have to add acid to get to your alcohol. <clears throat> you can do the same thing by breaking any of these bonds. So you could start with um, this. Oh, I guess I have that backwards. It should be Mg and Br like that. This is your green yard reagent, or you could start with your um, ethyl group as your green yard reagent. Any of those would be absolutely fine, but just make sure you have all of the steps. Start with the alkyl halide, add the magnesium, you know, all of that to propose your synthesis. Okay. Show the steps and reagents necessary to prepare the following um, from organic compounds that has six carbons or less. So again, this is a deals alder. I'm going to look at um, this double bond, and I'm going to assume that was the diene. And then this 5 and 6 is usually the dienophile. And I have them pointed the same way because stereochemistry is retain retained. And then I need my methyl groups on here. So if I reacted that forward, that would get me the product that I want. 
Now, you could technically stop there because chlorine is a good electron withdrawing group, honestly. So you could start there. If you didn't want to start with um, any halogens, you could have this and use um, SOCl2. That's fine, too. If you want an even better electron withdrawing group, like chlorine is, I would say, kind of a middle-of-the-road electron withdrawing group, you can actually get the good electron withdrawing group you want from here. So you could say that I use SOCl2 after my Diels-Alder reaction. But OH is actually a good electron donating group, right? So that's not going to be super helpful if we want our diene to be electron withdrawing or our dienophile. So do you know a way that you can turn a good electron withdrawing group like maybe an ester or a carbonyl into um, an alcohol? You do if you have like an aldehyde or even an ester. So if you had this as your electron withdrawing groups, you could use LAH, or if you have an aldehyde, an ABH4 to go from that to that. And then you would break up your Diels alder and have this as your original Diels alder. So either of these are valid. Um, this might seem easier on paper, but if you went into the lab and tried to do this reaction, this is not going to be as fast of a reaction as this. So if you need to have a time effective Diels alder, you'd actually want to use something with better electron withdrawing groups. So you need to always consider that. Like if there was a question that was like, which is the best Diels alder synthesis of the following compound? You know, both of these are going to get you there but this one is the best one because it has the best electron withdrawing groups on the diene file and it has, oh, it's the same electron donating groups on the diene. Okay. Um, the next one is multi-step synthesis. So people asked me a few times how I look at multi-step synthesis and I just take it one at a time. So I just look at this one to get A and I look at I go through my whole list of all my reactions. Is this an acid base? There's not a good acid. There's not a good base. No. Is this substitution? No. There's nothing being substituted. There's no good leaving group. It starts with a double bond, so definitely not. Is this an elimination? Well, you'd have to eliminate to get another double bond. There's not a good leaving group, so again, no. Is this an addition? Yes. I see a double bond and something that adds in. Now, one thing that's important is you got to look at both of these, and this is a halohydrin formation. It doesn't just add Br, it adds H2O. So that is actually going to make Br on one side and OH on the other. And this is all the way back to like chapter 8. So if you need a review of that, you can do that. And then, um, and it adds where one, it adds anti. So one's a dash and one's a wedge. Now, the next step is KOH. So I'm going to go back to the top of my list. Is this acid base? And I actually think, yes, this is because OH minus K plus, this is a good base and alcohol is relatively um, acidic. So if we have Br and O minus, that's going to be the first thing that happens. But this O minus is really reactive and bromine is a good leaving group. So actually, this is a way to form an epoxide. We talked about this very briefly. If you don't remember it, I wouldn't freak out too much, but that is a way to make an epoxide ring by performing an SN2 reaction on yourself, or like the ring performing an SN2 reaction on itself. So this would be your final answer. It makes an epoxide. Okay, the next one, multi-step, again, I'm gonna go one at a time, and I recognize PBR3 right off the top of my head. I don't even have to go through my long list. PBR3 turns primary alcohols into bromine or secondary alcohols into bromine. And then if you put it in magnesium in, um, I thought, uh, eth what is that called? Ether. <laughs> um, it will make a green yard reagent. Okay. And hopefully you just recognize those off the top of your head, right? Like we don't have to go down the whole list of not being sure because those are pretty unique reagents. So I always 
recognize those. But if you don't, you can go try to go down your list and do kind of process of elimination. The next thing is we add this to an ether, and because it's symmetrical, it can attack from either side, but I'm going to get rid of the MGBR and just draw this as a carb anion. Um, did I lose a carbon? Yes, I, no, I didn't. So there's a carbon right here. Yeah, okay. So this carbon, I always worry about losing carbons. That's like one of my things that I would lose points for on exams, and it never really went away. So um, I always look out for that. So this, it will attack, and the ring will open. And this is, I'm going to start right at the ring being carbon one, two, three, four. Okay, so a new bond before, formed between carbon two and three. So one, two, three, so that's the new bond. Carbon four is still there, and the bond broke between carbon three and this oxygen, but it didn't break between four and this oxygen, so then it's O minus. So that would be the end of reacting it with that. So we've, we've gotten from A to B, and now we're at C, and if you add C plus H3O plus, that will give you that's just done in the workup, and it should be OH. And actually, I don't know if this was intentional, but if you have excess acid and heat, it could do an elimination reaction, although it's not going to be super favored as a primary and get you a double bond right there. But I don't know if that was the goal of that, <laughs> of adding heat there. I think it's just supposed to be H+. plus. Okay, that could be wrong. Hopefully it wouldn't be that um, unclear on a free response question. Okay, the next one, I hadn't actually seen this um, listed out like this in a really long time, so I did not remember this. This is just a protecting group. You're more likely to see a protecting group like this with acid um, to make basically this structure, you know, to make an ether. So this is just a kind of a different way of saying basically that same thing. It'll give you this. It basically does the same thing as this plus H plus to give you um, a protecting group. I wouldn't worry about that. That's basically just to get across the idea that if you had this reaction, you could not react it with a green yard reagent. And I hope you know the answer as to why is because there's an alcohol there. So if on a test question, it's something like, hey, why doesn't this reaction work? Or what is the first step you would need to do to react this with a Grignard reagent? You have to know that this alcohol has an acidic enough proton that will quench that Grignard reagent and the reaction won't go. So this won't work. So we have to do a protecting group first. So that's the biggest thing I want you to take away. I don't think you need to memorize this reagent. Um, the biggest thing is just you know why we did that first step. And then we have CH3. MGBR, which is essentially just CH3 minus. So this comes up and attacks and kicks up. And I've done this a few times, but I think this is really important. If you have this ketone and a nucleophile, it will attack and kick up, and you'll get O minus in your nucleophile. If there's a leaving group, your nucleophile will attack, same as in the first one, kick up, and you'll get O minus your leaving group and your nucleophile. But this double bond can recover and kick out your leaving group, so you end up with this. Then your other excess nucleophile can attack and kick up again, and you get this. So right here we have this ester, which in this situation is a good leaving group. So our CH3 will attack once and kick up, and it'll become O minus like this. I'm running out of space, so I'm actually just going to get a blank sheet of paper. Okay, I'll use this. Um, so we have our protected group. The CH3 comes up and attacks, and that kicks up, and what you get is O minus. This is a good leaving group, and then your CH3 attacked right there. So this will come and kick out the good leaving group. Your CH3 attached, so it's still right there. And then your nucleophile, your CH3 minus, can actually come in and attack again. So you'll get O minus, because it attacked. C 
CH3, CH3, and then you have your protecting group. And then the next step is to add acid to it. When you add acid to a protecting group, it recovers the alcohol. So that alcohol is recovered, and so is that one. And that should be your final answer. Okay, and then, whoo, this is a lot. Okay, I'm going to draw a line here so you know where my work for this one starts. Okay, so this first, again, on multi-step synthesis, so I'm going to group it one at a time. And this looks like reagents one and two, but actually, hopefully, you remember from chapter 11 and from chapter 8 when we learned about hydroboration oxidation that these two go together. So this is actually, in my mind, the first step. So this, these together is the first step. And this is BH3, THF, H2O2, NaOH is hydroboration oxidation. So if we go all the way back to our review at the very, very beginning, that is this section. And I posted a whole video about that. If you don't remember how to know like which side it adds on, go check out that video. It's called Adding Water Across a Double Bond. Um, and I'll link to it down below in um, the description as well. But that adds anti-Markovnikov, which means the alcohol adds to this side. Okay, so that's the that's all that you need to worry about for this first step is that it adds alcohol and it adds anti-Markovnikov. The next step, PCC, that's not usually a two-step reaction, it's just one. So this is the second thing that'll happen. And hopefully you remember from um, going over the different oxidizing agents that PCC is the one that takes a primary alcohol to an aldehyde. So it will not go to a carboxylic acid. It goes to an aldehyde. Um, and then this last one might look scary initially, but if you just, like, chill out for a second and try to remember what you know. This CH, C, uh, C triple bond with the carbon chain is basically the same as if you had a Grignard reagent, right? If it was just instead of a, Na plus MgBr, that's what we do with Grignard reagents. So you know what happens when Grignard reagents attack a carbonyl carbon. They attack the par partial positive center and that kicks up and you get H, O, O, no. I just redrew that. It's O minus. Wow. I don't know what, what happened to my brain there. I'm running out of space and I freaked out, I guess. So you get O minus H in your carbon, carbon, triple bond attached. C, 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 H2, C, H3. Um, and then that's it because there's no acid in that step. It's just this. But this NH4Cl is actually NH4 plus Cl minus, and that is acidic. So that gives you your H plus. If you're ever not sure and you're like, oh, normally we have an acid here, that will clear it up for you. Sorry about my crazy way of drawing this, but I'm totally running out of space. So there's your answer. Okay, I think that's actually it for this review. I hope that was helpful for you. If you have any questions or you need me to do anything else, just let me know. Good luck studying.